Hubbard here to kick off our semester of uh, the spring semester 2019 K Club. I've um, got a really great lineup for you this semester. Um, I'll talk to you in just a moment about today's session, but just to give you a little sneak preview for the rest of the semester, um, we're going to be talking about rigor and transparency to enhance reproducibility next month. And the month after that, we're going to have a panel of K awardees. Tell us lessons learned from the K application process. You know, what's their grantsmanship? What's the real? What would they have done differently if they had to do it all over again? That sort of thing. So I think that'll be really valuable to hear their insight. And we're going to dive more into the mentor-mentor relationship through some case studies that I think you'll all find really interesting. And just a little bit of a, a plug to that one. What we really want to do is sort of pose it as hypothetical. So, I have this friend who's having this problem with their mentor. What would you suggest? So, be thinking about those hypotheticals and you can send them to me and we can put those as our case studies for that session. And then we're going to finish up the semester with uh, communicating your science best practices for different venues. Because it'll be a shape up to be a really nice semester. Um, as I always tell you, uh, so I'm, by the way, I'm Stacey Palm, and Director for Pediatric Research Operations and co-director of the K Club. And as I always mentioned, is we really um, crave your feedback. We want this is all for you. We really want to know what you liked about today, what you want to see more for the future. Um, and many of you may recognize the topics that we have slated for this semester because Quite frankly, we, they're all from feedback that we've gotten. So please, please, please make sure you respond to the survey uh, that Barbara will distribute after today's K Club. And then you will be entered into the Crown Royale bag <coughs> in the running to win the K Club mug. We're coming in limited supply, so soon to be a collector's item. And we'll all of really hope that you, your name will be drawn out of the Crown Royale bag from the, from the December K Club. Every once you responded with feedback, I'll have our speaker do the honor. Thank you. Oh, Daniel Runko. Right. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, okay. He's probably on his way, but we'll make sure Dan gets it. Thank you, Dan, for your feedback. All right, so today I can't tell you how excited I am about our speaker today. Um, Lakshman Krishnamurti, or otherwise known as Dr. Chris, um, at, came to a recent K-Club at last semester, and at the end, I've never had this happen before. I was really excited. He came up and he was complimenting the K-Club and the interaction of the K-Clubbers, and said that he would love to give a presentation on mentorship. And this is a this is a, a format that we've not followed before, having a mentor come in and, and share with us his experiences and his ideas for best practices, and I think that it's just wonderful. I'm so grateful for him for coming to us for that. So uh, Dr. Fish is a professor of pediatrics and the director of the BMP program in the Athletic Cancer and Blood Disorder Center here at Emory and Children. His areas of interest in research are clinical research in human homeopathies, hematopathic sound cell transplantation, and the system's approach to the delivery of health care. He has a successful track record in extramural funding, including from NIH and CORI, and he is uh, the lead faculty leader of a relatively new offshoot of our pediatric bio staff core, the qualitative core. Um, and so in addition to all of these great credentials he has as a scientist, I have to say having sort of a, a, a viewing him as a, a qualitative core leader, I really admire how he mentors people at all levels of the organization. He takes a keen interest in what people are doing and really himself, I see with my own two eyes, practices best practices in, in, in mentorship. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Chris. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for coming out. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're all on mentors and mentees, right? Um, and you have a pretty good idea of what it actually means. We have to actually talk about it. The risk you run is uh, presenting a long list of platitudes. So I thought, well, how am I going to address this um, in a slightly different way? So I thought, why not look at stories of mentorship, you know, from ancient times? Yes, we look at people who analyze this and, and sort of look at some of the fine 
findings, and especially the ones that I agree with. Um, and also look at some contemporary um, thoughts on mentorship. Um, and I have a few case theories um, and see how we can apply those uh, to those cases. Um, and then we'll leave you uh, with a prayer for the mentor and mentee uh, in the end. So let's start with the Old Testament. Um, so I just want to tell you I have no expertise in the Old Testament, uh, but I'm good sources. Um, and, um, so, and that's the source that I uh, have uh, included at bottom. And so let's start with our first story. And the story of the relationship between Jethro and Moses. Okay. So Moses um, and Jethro had a trusted relationship. In fact, I mean, Moses married Jethro's daughter. Now, don't take get too many ideas of what mentorship here. Uh, but they had a close relationship. And in fact, Moses worked for 40 years, you know, meant, um, minding the flock uh, for uh, Jethro. Um, and then he got the call. And he wanted to go and free his people from Egypt. And he went there and did that. And then Jethro came and, you know, recognized him. So this was not somebody who was sort of molded to be a leader. He was there. He went into the flock. And then he eventually became the great uh, leader. So here's what we learned from the story of Jethro and Moses. The foundation of mentoring is a close relationship. Now, not necessarily as close as just from most of them. Just, um, the only way a, men a mentoring relationship will work is if there is transparency. The mentor must genuinely desire the best for his mentee. Mentors make positive investments in life of men. And then mentoring is only possible to support uh, This is what we learned from Moses. <coughs> Let's look at the next story. But Moses, from his experience with mentoring, I think did an even better job with being mentored. He actually picked Joshua. And Joshua, incidentally, was one of the 12 spies of Israel uh, sent by Moses uh, to Canaan. And then actually, Joshua, after Moses died, became the leader. So, um, this is a beautiful painting. I didn't paint it. Um, so, we learned from the story of mentorship of Joshua by Moses. But so it was a method for mentors because he showed good potential. So, that's one of the things that come up when you do select mentees. But you get a mentee that happens to be a fine to you or is pending you a flock. Joshua then had initial success. They had the victory at Amalek, and he was given opportunity for further service and training. Joshua learned many things, including a lesson of humility from Moses. Joshua believed in himself. He had courage, even when others did. And so Moses actually prepared Joshua to receive the baton of leadership. And then the day came when Joshua had to step up and lead the people without Moses' presence. So this was a systematic and organized preparation and mentor. Let's look at another mentorship that didn't turn out that great. And this was uh, Samuel and Saul. So Saul, as you can see in the picture, was a handsome and well-prepared young man. He was clearly going places. He had so much potential and natural ability. And of course, uh, Samuel, um, you know, mentored, mentored him. He uh, Saul was started off pretty well. He, it was, became pretty obvious pretty quickly that he had character flaws and he wasn't going to succeed. And Samuel tried his best mentor him and get him back on track. There was a mentor only do so much. Uh, mentoring can be a heartbreaking thing. You can put in a lot of effort into mentoring and it may not be <coughs> There should be all your hopes and dreams up that your mentee is going to do great things. Um, because you may have to move on and help 
other. So the other thing is who we choose to mentor may not always be the guy with the greatest potential or the one that everyone would pick first. What do you think about the story? It's very hard. I can't beat you. Does that make any sense to you? Any Old Testament scholars here? No, clearly not. So I can say almost anything. That would be okay. All right, so let's move on from the Old Testament. Okay, so this is a little bit more con uh, contemporary. So there was a series on mentorship at the Harvard Business And you guys say six things that we mentors should do. Use mentees carefully. Establish a mentor team. Add off risk. The risks between mentor and mentee are inherent in the relationship. Resolve them. Don't commit mentorship malpractice. You ever seen that? Anybody? No? Okay. <laughs> Prepare for transitions to independence. There's some more from Harvard Best Business Review. Relationship before in the front before mentorship. Focus on character rather than competence. Show loudly about your optimism and keep quiet with it. Be more loyal to your mentee than to your company. I hope you guys are seeing this and thinking about it and answering questions later. Um, and this is how they describe this mentoring cycle. You start with building support, sort of making a contractual agreement of what the mentor should go to be, set some goals, monitor progress, and then you reach a level of maturation and eventually a closure of that relationship. Now, talk about it. Um, the psychologists here uh, would know about Dave Nathan, um, who wrote, uh, wrote the textbook Nathan and Ozzy. And his mentor, David Williams, who is just a uh, you know, the chief therapist at Harvard, I mean, he, so they build me every month. And David Williams said, well, I just talked to David, and I just do whatever he tells me. And this guy is like super numero uno. So I don't know about those. <coughs> so let me go on to this, with that thought with the what mentoring is not. And I hope to, I found this provocative and I hope you all think about this provocative. Mentoring is not for dealing with underperforming individuals. Well, they're only going to mentor people who are performing on the top of the What is it then? Mentoring is not about taking on problems or work of the mentee. A mentor should not find themselves doing things outside the mentoring session for a mentee. I'd like to think about it and I'd like to share with you. Mentoring is not about promoting, sponsoring, or protecting the mentee. Mentoring is not intended to deal with personal issues. Mentoring is not therapy. And mentoring is not allowing people to know that may be some problem. This is a provocative slide, and I think that one slide is with all the provocative stuff. I'd like you all to think about it. Let's go on to some actual case studies, and then maybe later we can talk about what we think about. So, Menti A, this wasn't the most confident person, but very confident. Uh, like a lot of us, they were stressed in for some light, but willing to take criticism. Not sure about direct. They want to do what they show up. Some people could say, oh, well, personal life, stresses, all that like function, confidence, uncertainty. Oh, these are all negative. So how do you talk about that? Well, what about if there's a mentee of personal stresses? You actually just support them. So, for them can ultimately overcome strengthening their performance. So, my belief is mentor must be passionate, supportive, cheater, and an active listener. 
when they are confident or showed an advocacy in the department. So you gain recognition, join faculty, that may end right. The mentor is first and always an advocate. Then he's on first about research. Or at the moment, the brainstorm of the mentor, identified research program. Many teams work hard at the project, solve many problems, overly barriers, adversity. Mentor has to help find what motivates the mentor inspire the example, but it's the mentee who is doing all the work to overcome barriers. So opportunity. That's where the mentor in every meeting is looking to see who to introduce the mentee to, what senior investigators show up, how to advocate the mentee in the symposiums and committees and grants. Mentee begins to be recognized by senior investigators in the field of folks and work. The mentor must model networking, always opening the door for mentees. Mentor must sponsor and broker for mentees. Mentee disheartened, like all of us, by rejection of papers, grants. English mentee to persevere. Some grants eventually get accepted. Mentor must help prepare the mentee deal with real life problems and barriers in academic progression. This said, well, the mentor and mentee have a symbiotic relationship, <coughs> but what is the path to independence? And that's real life code. And this is really important. That the mentor and mentee identify what will belong to the mentor and what the mentee will take away. And to be sure about this relationship, continue to work with the mentor. Concepts of intrinsic to shared research followed by the separation. He must be planned. Mentor has multiple areas of research. The man is ready to take advantage of opportunities. A lot of differences. Watch this with increasing recognition of the mentee with pride. Story. Mentee have open conversation about future goals and they can collaborate. So, integrity are central to the mentor. And recognize. Yes. Can, can you expand a little bit on how do you establish that, the open lines of communication? So one of the things that you're talking about in situations, you know, some are pretty straightforward, right? You can just see them. But if you establish that rapport with your mentee, it's not easy. Yeah. You close the door. <laughs> you put the um, Also, I think they meant to me hard to learn lecture. It's not cool when you have to run out of the um, And there is no other way than to transparency and only happy conversation. To actually recognize the need for all of these conversations. A little bit. I'm curious, like, how do you actually build that rapport with your mentees? Like, do you have, like, scheduled meetings where you interact? Well, well first of all, you have to have scheduled meetings. Right. right. I mean, you could be meeting somebody every day, but if you don't have scheduled meetings, we have an agenda, and actually only talk about what things are going to be done, it's easy for time to go away and you've never actually talked. But you're always working on behalf of the mentee. There's so many different places that you're doing that. So you actually demonstrate the mentee all the time that you're a You know, there's a of opportunities to do that. But then I think the hardest part, I think, is to find what is yours and what is the mentee's and plan because you plan for working together, but you haven't planned for the separation. Can I have a question? So I wonder, that makes me think about sometimes people say you should enter into a mentoring mentee contract where it's actually a written document, rules of engagement, we will meet this many times, be even outlining this marquee between the research. It feels kind of prescriptive, and I know some mentors are just like, yeah, I wouldn't do that. But I wonder, I mean, do you do that? Is that, have you seen it? I, I would say having a recurrent meeting is extremely important. The kind of not so much. <laughs> depends on, on you. Um, and, and, and as I'll show you in, in the slides, I mean, not every mentor and mentee meet at the same level. And the relationships are very mentor mentee specific. Um, then some questions about having what is meant and what isn't. The boundaries are. Um, 
No, I mean, there are extreme issues where people have crossed the boundaries, which is problematic. Uh, even um, with the, you know, to standard deviations with a lot of variability, what you might do for one thing and the way for another. So this, uh, Man TV is, didn't have all of these issues, self-confident, conscientious, not really sure about the direction of research. What we really want to do is research. I'm a fellow I really want to improve care. So uncertainty about uh, research focus and research research. I'm certainly wanting to research research for of course. I'm a clinician, you know, clinical research. Um, no work chapters. Uh, really no personal involvement in sort of trying to overcome them. So, gaining recognition, doing good. But about research, well, you can sit down and brainstorm and figure out what you have to do. You know what you have to get done in the spirit of time is something that will give you a good paper and get you out of the work. And mentors may be able to do this. Many multiple areas of research, and Messi is really not interested in mine. You may not see eye to eye and everything. Messi and Mentor clearly had a problem from the beginning. And he felt, oh, well, this is an abstract. I'm the first author. I really <coughs> don't know enough. I don't think that you really get to do this problem. Uh, and then he had some conversations. Trust and integrity are central to monitoring the relationship. Have to sharing communication. For opportunities, and in investigators, advocates, networking, et cetera. Many successful, many of the news acts, um, and many of these institutions. Apparently, clearly understood that meant he was going to pursue a new line of research. Many of grant based on many of data. Many of have a conversation and complete rough year. Okay. That there was a conflict that was currently resolved, but not there. Everybody's satisfaction. And there's never really a plan. Uh, what was this person supposed to do? What was this new line of research? So this separation was not. And so it's sort of, the, I think, the worst outcome of a mentor mentee relationship, where it ruptures after. And it all turns out that the mentor is he goes to a new place, and mentee gets funded, and the training was good, but a mentee still has. In spite of all of these conversations, I think it wasn't in each house the extent of what the person was doing. Chris, what happened here? You started off with the mentee thinking they didn't want to do research, and they <laughs> didn't want to take <laughs> the mentor's opportunities, and they actively had conflicts with their mentor, and now with their new institution, they want to write a okay? case? And get funded? Well, people can change, you know? I'm telling you, you go to the master's program, and you stop, and you get interested in the research. Your research stands out. So you only have this whole world open up to you. Um, people change. I time. wonder if at that time when the mentee left the mentor, they had not expressed that change of heart. You no, know, the I mentor may have thought, oh, you did never really want to continue research. The mentee did. So, uh, as a so we'll pediatric hematologist, right? So, you're an academic, whether you like it or not. So, so they go get an academic job and they're going to get uh, research. I think the issue really was that several people in the institution felt that they owned this research. The mentor and the mentor's mentor felt that they owned the research. They felt that they owned the research. He went and said, Well, I did all this work. I'm going to be place. They're not going to be able to do this work without me. I've got a grant here. So, and then the mentor and he said, well, if you're not going to do this, what is it that you're going to do? But I think that that was the biggest failure here. He's not planning that separation. And, and that's the hardest part, is how to plan that separation. So it's prior to you know, leave, him or her leaving and getting a K, if a, any reviewer just could, like, be like, words I and observe this relationship, would they have said, that's symbiotic relationship. You don't that person didn't have a pathway to independence. That's when they were like the Correct. fellow earlier on. Correct. But but at the time you didn't have a grant where this was exposed. 
right, right, right. Nobody was reviewing them because they weren't applying for a grant. But right. It's true. So when you write a grant, you get the quote that that was not a separation plan. <laughs> and the separation plan would have been fair to all. And so that's not being the case, I think, and she did being the worst outcome. So, NTC, self confidence, eh, not very contentious. That's a problem. <laughs> going to criticism. Not sure what direction we're going to be a reproductive team, but not always. Um, so then again, <coughs> lack of commitment, unstresses in personal life, uncertainty. But not a very forthcoming. So it's not somebody that's sitting in an office with a plane and, you know, trying to work out problems. But you can be a supporter and cheerleader even in that person. Um, but even if they're lacking commitment, you can support and advocate for this person. who well, met the requirements of the training. Mentors always an advocate. I'm so about research, so you can sit down and brainstorm. We actually complete that research and did do it. Um, and continue to advocate to introduce them to senior investigators. Eventually uh, secures a faculty position, advances the clinical faculty, not really going to do research later. But ultimately, you have to prepare the mentee people like the way they want to do. Um, but you can't really make them do stuff they don't want to do. Mentee level faculty, mentee, mentee a good friend. Uh, so it beats us together. Anymore. So, if you think about this relation, you can go so far as the mentee. Yep. Yeah. All right. Uh, should it be your okay. So, this is another, this is somebody who's a mentee who actually did research and quit research and had multiple career changes. And they actually took a staff job in a research project. Far away from research, a multiple career change, straight from primary research. The traditional research training job, not the place we're looking to master. Um, generally doing good, uh, pretty confident, <coughs> has been uncertain about research. Yeah. But you can sit down and brainstorm, and the mentee works hard at it and actually figures out a new research path. He goes in an unintentional way. And then the same thing, again, networking, advocating, and then redefine the career goal and actually take the research path from having given up the research path. It goes back to lessons learned, model working, prepare mentee, deal with life and barriers, and the first is in encourage support. Uh, so, and this mentee is actually doing really well and it's being recognized and it's growing. Uh, so I think it goes back to the same issues of trust and integrity, continual communication, so you think of this relationship. Somebody was going anywhere. But they're actually going back in research. I need to study. He was a star, a superstar. Yes, so. Content, contentious, efficient. Not sure about the district's direction of research, but willing to accept guidance. Now, don't be gold. But anyway, he's willing to accept guidance. No Regarded, just took off from day one. Self confident, more organized than the mentor. Um, men, yeah, you know, like they have to identify each other's stressors. Um, and men found a good area of research, got funded, um, got recognized nationally, um, you know, um, really doing extremely well identifying what you're supposed to do as a mentor. He expresses major life So you have already succeeded, succeeded in research, and now boom, mentee has to go on. Men are then supporting mentee. See what life is like. Trying to figure out how to hit the reset button of research, a new direction, and be actually able to reset and actually go to another institution, and find another career path, another mentor, and continue to grow as a mentor. Happy, satisfied, and again, have the mentee. And again, highlighting that trust and integrity are central to this question. <coughs> so, I've given you a few uh, key theories, and then we can talk about it. But I want to end here with a prayer for the mentor and the mentee. Okay? So, 
that this from the Veda, and I have given you a literal translation, and within brackets are my tongue in cheek comments, <coughs> but just so you know the difference between the translation and my tongue in cheek comments. Yeah. Perhaps 
Um, and, uh, you know, especially with writing blogs, it's really important to yeah. want to say how each one of those people will do. In, in the ID division, um, all of our fellows have a career mentor and then a research mentor, which is usually not the same person. Sure. And the career mentor is more of a sort of assistance and some yeah. help introduce yeah. somebody to different research mentors. Sure. And so I think by having that team, um, the, that allows us from the situation that Marianne was talking about, where someone may not feel that they can give everything to somebody, sure. but you know, they're able to at least help guide them, which is oftentimes sure. what's needed. And I think that I, you know, I, I accept that I said mentor in the singular. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and it may be that you may get different things. Yeah, I would just like to reiterate that. I don't, I don't think um, in my generation that we've made clear that you're not going to get every one person. And you, I, I figure that out by some sort of disappointment, you know. But, but as I look back 25 years, I realize I eventually did get something. It's just not everything. And I think that that, that is the issue, is that it, that's where team mentoring can be really, really helpful. And you can be Literally, people meeting in a room at least maybe once every you know, six months to a year versus sort of saying to the primary mentor, you know, delegating out um, different tasks. And I do think those <laughs> the specific um, because there's different games, there's secondary games for the mentor from those two, and that's always so, what's in the balance, right? So. Um, I'm going to focus on um, what would be a core of mentorship. Is a commitment, caring, and advocacy of all. That can apply to anybody, because of singular or plural. However, I didn't talk about what, what's in for the mentor. And that's partly because I was trying to be data driven. It's really hard to be data driven on this. And so, what do you think there is in it for the mentor? What would a mentor get out of the mentorship? At least for me, a lot of it is teaching. I mean, part of the reason I'm in academics is the joy of teaching someone how to succeed in life, in lab, or whatever it is they're doing. Just it's almost the way I, I with my seven year old, a little bit of something where you want them to be almost better than you are. Want them to get to a place that they want to be. I think for me, the hardest thing has been trying to establish where that person wants to go because this is, they don't always know, and there are things that just you know. I was going to my earlier question earlier, and how do you establish a line of trust so that you even build over time? Or you have one of the examples where they change what they want to do with their career, yeah. and how do you help them? And when you when do you identify that you may not be the best person to get them there, and you kind of Try to not help on that, um, but it's a moving target. So. It is a moving target. So, so some things you can say, well, uh, I'm sorry, 70% of pediatric hematologists are going to work in an academic setting. So, um, the best chance of getting hired are if you do research and get your research succeed. I mean, similarly, you have to graduate your PhD, so you better get that research done and you get it here. Um, but beyond that, I mean, if somebody decides that they don't want to keep on doing it, or they want to go in a different direction, and you just don't have to respect what they want to do. And you can't make what they don't want to drink. Uh, and I think we all make the mistake also that we drank the Kool-Aid and we want you to drink the Kool-Aid. And they may not be quite ready uh, for that. And that requires a little bit of having down with yourself to be able to um, The hardest part, I think, is that you Conceiving together, you're so involved in it, how do you separate? And if you don't do that, it, it, that case was a really bad outcome. That was for years. Yes. Um, the comment would be that there's just like differences in mentees, there's also differences in personalities for the mentors. Mm -hmm. I think it would be important to, as a mentor to identify your own character, mm -hmm. characteristics, or what 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 is your anxiety or, or what your limitations are. And then you can help identify who might be a good mentee for you that's maybe matched or maybe the opposite. You have to decide what. That's a great point. So, so when does the mentor not feel threatened? You know, so the, you know, 
when the mentor not saying, well, my, it's my selfishness that I'm trying to be. So, so that's why I think that you have to be at some point of being okay uh, in a career. Probably what I've most enjoyed in my mentors are people who are creative and people who are just sunshine. So I think that if they walk into the room and bring sunshine with them, I do anything with that. I mean, I'm telling you, like, these are the experiences. Yeah. Yes, I was just kind of the how often do you really think that mentors and mentees choose each other because of personal characteristics versus the specific topics that they do? So you need this particular organism, you study this particular hematologic disease, you have a person for me at this institution where I am right now. And that's how it really happens, I'd say, the majority of the time, don't you think? And then you have to just be fortunate or unfortunate. Fortunate. And if you're unfortunate, then you seek out more mentors, I guess. So, great point. So, when we were fellows, um, we had this mentorship talk with people who gave the talk, uh, both of whom are department chairs now. And one said, well, I knew I was going to work on Canada, and I walked up and met her and said, I'm going to work in your lab, that's what I want to do. The other person said, I'm a good guy, you know, and um, do what I asked him to do, put me to work. And it just sort of comes out in the wash. I mean, it could be um, either path. And the other thing, and I, I actually put my hand up. So I was like, yeah, but there's nobody here who does what I exactly want to do. And she will just find this person that is closest to what you want to do. And that will put you, you know, be a different spin on what you want, which is what I do. What's that? Yes. I was recently reading a, um, a feed online about mentoring and something that um, the person brought up was the idea of you know who your grand mentors are. So the people who mentor your mentors and this whole idea of legacy building. And I thought that was a really unique way to think about <coughs> mentors in terms of um, you know, people who are gonna build on what you've done and carry pieces of your work forward. <coughs> So you mentor the mentor. Yeah, it was it was just a, and it got me really curious to think about I wonder who my grand mentors are and what were they like? And they had to <laughs> they had to have been really unique people to have cultivated these people who did such great things for me. And I just really liked the idea of thinking about that. Yeah, I never got to meet my uh basic science lab for grand mentor. Mm -hmm. I'm not basic science that gives you advice. Um, and then my clinical and translational research mentor had taken his mentor to court. <laughs> <laughs> oh <my God>. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you don't want to know that. <laughs> that didn't help. <laughs> so, um, I mean, so he tried innovation and inventiveness, but he didn't really know how to advocate for people, you know, beyond the point. So I think we're always also always learning. And I do this. It's another big at your job. It <laughs> sometimes uh, it shows that what do you think about talking to others who have been mentored by that person? But what's, what's your experience with that? Please, you got the you got the cup today. <laughs> well, <laughs> I think uh, well, I think it's actually helpful to talk to other people who have had similar tours or similar goals. Taking that advice with a grain of salt, because I think it's thinking towards the end, but, you know, every mentor and mentee relationship is a little bit different. Absolutely. And so just because someone didn't work with a mentor doesn't mean that you won't. Right. And I think it is important to know the thing that a mentor does well or does not do well. Or from a flip perspective, of knowing the strengths and the weaknesses of his or her particular mentee can make the relationship, as you said, more fruitful for both. I, I think exactly like finding the strength in that person and the potential in that person is what's most fascinating. So one of the things that I only think that you get out of a mentorship is finding the spark in that person. Is that sort of cool? You can think. Spark in everybody, so you think. Yeah, I mean, I think when they come up with an idea that, you know, had not been in your, you know, halfway, um, whether it's clinical or specific, um, of you know, finding their own fitting, and it just really <coughs> makes you kind of the fact that you also have to 
eight sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 What do you think you said? Some people may not see themselves as mentors. Idols. Yeah, I think I kind of didn't really finish that thought. I think it was. Um, the first question was asked about does the mentor decide or does the mentee decide, right? If, if mm -hmm. that relationship is going to be there. Just recognizing that um, people don't advertise themselves out there. It's like, hey, I'm, I'm a mentor. We have a bunch of mentors here. Like this institution actually has a bunch of scientists or PhD scientists who are here who also, because they're the university, are by <coughs> definition of their job. And so, Coming at the fact that um, some may be born to do this and may love to do it, and some people might not. Some people might think of themselves still as just you're told that they need to be selfish and that that's an okay and good thing. And some people persist with that quality their whole life and don't really want to become a mentor. And I'm glad you asked me this. I was actually, before you asked me that, I was kind of thinking to myself, can you tell us when was the first time you became a mentor? And then how did that switch? And did you feel for a while like you were the, is there a transition between those? I mean, at some point you were the trainee, and now you're the mentor. And overlap of, of of that, and and how did it go at first? Well, it's easy. You find out if you're the giver or the receiver of Kleenex. <laughs> 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 is that just you cry? Is that what you think? Mentors can't cry. <laughs> 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 well, mentors don't want to cry. <laughs> I, I was just gonna say, I think any time you're in a supervisory role, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you you're mentor. You may not see it as mentoring, you may yeah. not think of it, but the minute That's true. you can be under it, that. you're helping someone. Yeah. 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 It's mentoring, yeah, I mean, it may not be exactly, you may not have a yeah. written contract, but yeah. anytime you're helping someone with their life or career, you're mentoring. Now, we just, for oh, That's what you think, it's not official, it kind of creeps right. up on you. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, but, I mean, we talk about this, right, that you're interviewing all the time. Why are yeah. interviewing all the time? Some of it is because, well, I may want to get a job later, but also because People out here looking at you and in a professional setting, they're going to be looking at you and, hey, I'm going to be that or I want to avoid that, you know, that behavior. <laughs> That's when I was uh, learning how to pour gels and cut DNA in the lab. I mean, the, I was mentor to the person who was washing the helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's something that I can't do well. But the point, I think, is uh, when you're in mentally okay, mm -hmm. uh, who you are and where your career is, when that's when you make the position to really being able to be a mentor. Yeah, I was just going to say that I think at all points in our career, we're both being mentored and mm -hmm. mentoring others. So, like, even as a resident, I would certainly be a mentor to the medical student, right, for better work or whatever that is. And yeah. Me attending yeah. is like my mentor, right? And so at all, like, points in our <coughs> career life that, you know, has a great title on it. I think that that element kind of is through all of those, you know, yeah, sure, sure. whatever sure, sure. Yeah. they do are. It goes, like, up and down no matter where. Oh, I was just going to say, I'm also Ed Chocolate to the Kleenex. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I am so glad I came here today. This is a one ingredient <laughs> in my mentorship experience. Thank you. That's not good to me. As you can see, culturally, I wasn't ready. <laughs>
comments about trying to head off conflict at the past, keep open and transparent communication so that you can try to reduce conflict. And I was wondering if you had like a specific example of maybe a near miss. You saw, oh, no. <laughs> you saw like your relationship with your mentee was maybe headed in a conflict direction. And what did you do to like redirect that and prevent sort of that chasm from happening? We open in security. And you know, little jealousy. Right. And and you see your mentee paying more attention to your colleague and your rival. Okay. Okay. And then this is a simple example. You add it down and talk about. No other way than you actually to talk about it. And to create that environment, you can talk about anything. Yeah. It's well, thank you very much. There's a lot of fun for chocolate. That's the message. Well, I think we're going to be 